Well, hello and welcome to, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to our service this morning. Um, I probably know that we've been running the theme, Why Are We Here? And this is our fifth Sunday exploring that theme and we'll be looking at a response to that question, Why Are We Here? to Bear His Cross. And today, of course, is Passion Sunday. But before we start, um, I'd just like to briefly cover a couple of notices, um, both from uh, Mark's March 2nd letter. Uh, just a reminder that um, we'll be back actually in church on the, uh, on the 18th of April. Um, we'll actually be in church for the sunrise service. Obviously, we'll be outside by resuming the sunrise service. But that's only an in-person um, attendance service. So if you're interested in coming along to that, you're going to have to book and go to the to the booking site uh, and just book yourself in for that. Uh, the same applies to the service later in the morning at half past ten, actually in the church, socially distanced, of course. And again, that will be it will be necessary to book for that uh, through the church website. Um, the third event on that day, Sunday the 18th, is the church uh, annual, the annual church meeting. Um, that will be Zoom only. So we don't need to book, uh, just sort of turn up Zoom wise for that. So those are our notices this morning, particularly about the Easter arrangements, but you'll find them in full in Mark's letter. We open our service then with our call to worship, which is taken from Luke's Gospel chapter 9, verses 23 to 26. Then Jesus said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. So that call to worship sets the theme of our service today, the importance of bearing the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so to our first song. Um, again, I just leave you to pick that up from YouTube or whatever. It's a song by Matt Redman called Once Again. Well, welcome back. Now to our opening prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, you were a man of suffering, acquainted with grief loved and despised in equal measure. You understand humanity, know our failings. You love us despite the people that we are. When we, like Peter, deny you by word or action, forgive us. When we, like Judas, attempted to follow a different path, failing to pick up our cross to follow you, forgive us. When we, like those in the crowd, allow you to be crucified, forgive us. Bring us to the foot of the cross to stand next to the one who looked into your eyes and declared, surely this is the Son of God. Amen. My confession this morning we say together. Most merciful God, whose Son Jesus Christ was tempted in every way yet without sin, we confess before you that we have sinned. We have hungered after that which does not satisfy. We have compromised with evil. We have doubted your power to protect us. Forgive our lack of faith. Have mercy on our weakness. Restore in us such love and trust that we may pick up our cross, walk in your ways, and delight in doing your will. Amen. Thanks be to God. We continue, of course, although we are in lockdown, doing everything virtually. 
we continue to contribute our lives, our money, ourselves, to our church and to our Lord. So to our offertory prayer. Generous God, we give these offerings in gratitude, rejoicing in the abundance of your gifts to us. We give these offerings in faith, trusting that we will provide for our needs. We give these offerings in hope, knowing you can use them to spread your love in this world. And with these offerings we give ourselves. May we live with generous hearts and with open hands. Amen. I said earlier on that today is Passion Sunday and our reading reflects that, Jesus' passion on the cross. Our reading then is from Mark's Gospel, chapter 15, verses 21 to 32. And after I've completed this reading, I'm going to ask my colleague to reflect upon it. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charges against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days? Come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. And those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now over to Mike for his reflection. Why are we here? To bear his cross. Thank you, Mike. The theme of the reflection this morning is really taken from the first verse that we read today, Mark 15, 21. Whilst it may only be a brief mention, there is much here that we can think about and take from it. Our reading this morning comes after Christ's betrayal in the Garden of Gethsemane that Mark spoke about last week. Jesus is handed over to the Roman soldiers who further humiliate him, no doubt trying to break his spirit, his resolve, in exactly the same way that the physical abuse of the scourging was designed to weaken the body. History shows us numerous occasions when the military of a victorious or occupying power commit acts of barbarity towards the vanquished foe. And here we have a scene where the Roman soldiers who are sent far away from home to suppress these troublesome Jewish rebellions, when they have the chance to vent their anger and frustration on the leader of one of these rebellious fractions, or so they're told, I'm sure they did not hold back. And in those days, there was no war crimes tribunal to try and rectify the balance. And finally, Jesus is forced to carry the heavy cross member through the streets. And it's thought that that cross member weighed something like 45 kilos, 35 to 45 kilos. It's about one and a half times to two times the amount of luggage you can take on a flight. That is when we could fly, of course. And all the time, 
that the person is carrying this cross member, the local citizenry no doubt also joined in hurling insults and spitting at Jesus. And I'm making an assumption here uh, that that's the case. If we read further on in, in Mark, it specifically mentions that those who passed by hurled insults at Jesus when he hung on the cross. And I'm sure they would have insulted him on the way to the place of execution. And he's so weakened by the scourging that's taken place that he can't continue, or at least not at the pace that the Roman soldiers would like. So here the Roman soldiers did what the law said they could legally do. They pulled somebody out of the crowd and compelled them to carry the cross member to the place of execution where Jesus was nailed naked to the cross. The whole process designed to degrade the prisoner physically and emotionally. And perhaps that was a comfort. It would probably speed their death. A death designed to be painful as the victim hung there on the cross and the weight of their body made inhalation and exhalation very difficult and painful. And the only point their body is really supported were the nails. And the prisoner would try and shift the weight from one painful sight to another. No wonder Christ asked his father if another way could be found. And Mark makes it clear, though, that while Christ was the king, the purple robe and the crown of thorns point to this during the scourging, the sign above him at the crucifixion. And despite being king, there was no way that he could leave or avoid the cross. It was the culmination of his mission. We need to understand the barbarity of the crucifixion because I believe it helps us understand the enormity of Christ's sacrifice and the enormity of God's willingness to sacrifice his son to save us. Any parent would be heartbroken, would want to spare their son from such suffering if another way could be found. And this shows the lengths that God is going to go to, to redeem us from our sin. So in verse 21, we see the person pulled out of the crowd to carry the cross member is named Simon. And his sons are also named, which is quite unusual, Rufus and Alexander. And the city where Simon comes from, Cyrene, is also mentioned. Why is this? It is unusual. Presumably the names, particularly of the sons, meant something to the early church or to the people in Rome. Paul mentions a Rufus in his uh, letter to the Romans, and that's chapter 16, verse 13. Greet Rufus and his mother, who has been a mother to me too. Perhaps Simon's sons were better known, hence their inclusion here. There is some reason to think that Rufus and Alexander bore witness to what had happened to their father in Jerusalem that day, that they were active evangelists for Christ. I can certainly imagine that when Simon went home to Cyrene, he would be asked about his experience in Jerusalem and he would retell his story about being made to carry Christ's cross. And I like to think that after witnessing Simon's, uh, sorry, Jesus's death, Simon learned about Jesus and took his teachings back with him to Cyrene. Certainly he must have shared with his family and with his wife and sons who become members of the early church and to whom Paul seems to be referring in his letters to the church in Rome. And this is something that we're all called to do, isn't it? To share our faith with those around us. Why Cyrene? Cyrene was a large Greek city in modern day Libya. It's between Benghazi and Tobruk. It had a large Jewish population. There were 100,000 Jew, Judean Jews sent into exile there in about 300 
BC. The community even had its own synagogue in Jerusalem for those who were attending the festivals, like Simon. And later on, we'll see that Cyrene was also an important early Christian centre mentioned in Acts chapter 2, verse 10, chapter 6, verse 9, chapter 11, verse 20, and chapter 13, verse 1. Perhaps Simon and his family had something to do with establishing this early Christian outpost. Why Simon? Simon was most likely a, a devout Jew. He was, after all, attending the festival of Passover in Jerusalem. And I wonder if there was something in his manner or his dress, or dare I say it, even his skin colour, that made him stand out as an outsider. Was he perhaps more African looking than Arab looking? I don't know. But I don't think that God acts by accident. I believe Simon was led there for this moment. Perhaps in asking Simon to carry the cross of Jesus, the Roman soldiers avoided upsetting the local Jewish population by humiliating a local Jew, by involving them in the shameful act of carrying a prisoner's cross, something no Roman soldier would certainly stoop to. Perhaps Simon not knowing what was happening as he sought to find out. Perhaps he showed compassion for Jesus, who was so brutalised that he was unable to carry his own cross any further. The whole tone of this story, though, is that Simon was compelled under Roman law to obey the instruction of the Roman soldiers to carry the cross. Perhaps also Simon saw something different in Jesus. Did he witness Jesus speaking words of comfort to the women in the crowd, as recorded in Luke chapter 23, verses 27 to 31? Did Simon show compassion? Was Jesus's behaviour something that spurred him on to find out more about this strange man, who even at death's door sought to comfort others? Here is Simon confronted by Jesus, confronted by the cross. What happened to Jesus as a consequence? It is tempting, as I have done, to speculate that, Jesus, that Simon went home and told people what had happened to him in Jerusalem and perhaps spread the word about Christ and in part helped Cyrene become that early Christian centre that we can see later on in Acts. Perhaps he even stayed in Jerusalem, not only for the Passover, but also for Pentecost. It's believed that many pilgrims apparently did so. Quite an undertaking, about 50 nights in between the two. Was he one of the Cyrenians that heard Peter preach at Pentecost and became a Christian? Certainly his sons were well known to the early church hence them being mentioned by name. Did they spread his story because he was unwilling or unable to share it firsthand? We'll never know for certain. And it's also tempting to recall our own story when we were confronted by the cross of Jesus. It too became a turning point for us. We either accepted Jesus or we ran a mile. And I'm sure that for many of us, like Simon, meeting Christ was not at a time of our choosing, nor was it necessarily convenient, not what we had planned. For Simon, he was minding his own business, trying to enjoy the festival that he had come to Jerusalem for. And yet here he is dragged into the middle of this highly shameful execution of a revolutionary. He would have been at the centre of the vitriol that was being poured out upon Jesus. Some may even have thought that Simon was the criminal going to his execution and would have spat at him. 
so that throughout the rest of the journey, Simon was following Jesus. He would have also shared in his shame. I wonder if this is a model for our own discipleship. After only a little way, the cross member would have become heavy even for Simon. The rough wood rubbing his shoulders, perhaps splinters entering his shoulders and his hands as he tried to balance the load. He shared in Jesus's pain, albeit to a small measure. He shared in it. By the time Simon arrived at Golgotha, he would have been covered in Jesus's blood from the cross, along with the soldier's spittle. And this is something that we as believers must also be prepared for. When we pick up Jesus's cross, we must be prepared to share his pain, his suffering and his shame. And as such, I think this really helps us to realise the enormity of Christ's sacrifice for us. But nor should we lose sight of the prize that such obedience brings, that of eternal life through God's grace. And this, after all, was the whole purpose for Jesus's sacrifice, that we would be reconciled with the Father. Our reading also shows us what it means to take up his cross, that we need to support one another, to be there to carry burdens for one another, albeit temporarily, just as Simon carried Jesus's cross temporarily to Golgotha. And there is a charity that uh, I don't know if you're aware of it or really it's, it's a series of local charities based around Cyrenians. And uh, they have a principle of sharing the load of others, and especially around the housing needs, the care, the carrying the burden for the homeless and the vulnerable people, at least until they're on their own feet and can stand unaided. Simon's story does therefore, I believe, set out a pattern for our own discipleship, that of carrying burdens for others. As Simon stood there, stretching out his back, straightening himself up, watching Jesus being hoisted on the cross. I like to think that Simon stayed and watched. Until he heard Jesus cry out, it is finished. And then I speculate he must have heard the centurion confess that Jesus this man was the son of God. Confrontations with the cross leads to conversion. And in the story, we can see there are three conversions here. And I accept I'm perhaps joining up some dots that may or may not have been joined up. But I think it is good to speculate on these. Because it tells a story of the confrontation that we see at the foot of the cross. The first conversion, that of Simon. The second conversion, that of the robber or revolutionary, the rebel who was crucified with Jesus. We don't see it in this Mark version, but if you have a look at Luke's version, it's in there. Luke chapter 23, verse 42. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And finally, after the crucifixion, there is that of the Roman soldier. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. Confrontation with the cross leads to their conversion. It leads to our conversion and the sharing in Christ's death so that we also die to our sin. Taking up Jesus' cross as Simon did means more than taking on some generalised pain and discomfort. It means to take on his shame and his pain. 
as we follow in his footsteps. In doing so, we identify ourselves with his suffering as we walk behind him along that shameful and painful path, path that he is willingly walking for us. It means that I take up his death as my death to my sin and my selfishness. Just as Simon was, I need to metaphorically allow myself to be covered in the spittle from the jeering crowds, covered in the shame this world heaped upon Jesus, but also to be covered in his redeeming blood, washing me clean from my sins and reliance on the promise that if I suffer with and for Jesus, that I will also reign with him. In common with Simon, when we encounter Jesus and are confronted by the cross, we too may feel surprise. Why is this happening to me? We may feel annoyance. This is not what I had planned. This is not convenient. It is not a good time. We may feel reluctance. I'm not ready for this or I don't want this. And we may feel the embarrassment. Sharing in the shame of the crucifixion. Or in the weakness, I cannot allow anybody to see me like this. Notwithstanding, when we meet Jesus, we are confronted by his sacrifice, his cross. We, like Simon, are compelled to respond to Christ's call upon us. Amen. Lord, I would just pray that when we are confronted by the cross, we are ready to pick it up, ready to respond and accept you as our Lord and Saviour. We thank you for you, the sacrifice you made for us, that we might be reconciled with the Father. Amen. Thank you, Mike. And so to our next song, I think this is a, a most appropriate one, not only for our theme today, but for the day itself, Passion Sunday. Must Jesus bear the cross alone? So, welcome back to our prayers of intercession. These are responsive prayers. I'll say at the end of each prayer, God of love, to which the response is, hear our prayer. Let us pray. God of love, hear the cry of those who yearn for love. Fractured families, broken homes, neglected, unwanted, alone. God of love, hear our prayer. God of justice, hear the cry of those who yearn for justice. Persecuted and oppressed, exploited, ill-treated, broken. God of justice, hear our prayer. God of peace, hear the cry of those who yearn for peace. In battle zones and broken states, frightened, fearful, anxious. God of peace, hear our prayer. God of healing, hear the cry of those who yearn for healing, physical and spiritual, hurting, weakened, depressed. God of healing, hear our prayer. God of mercy, hear the cry of those who yearn for mercy. Convicted, in need of your grace, contrite, humble, bowed down. God of mercy, hear our prayer. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. May you know the peace of God, 
the love of God, the justice of God, and the healing and mercy of God this day and all days. Amen. And now let us say together the prayer that Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. It's always good to, to share the peace with all those around us. Let the peace of heart that comes from Christ be always present in your hearts and lives, for this is your responsibility and privilege as members of his body. The peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. Let us offer one another a sign of the peace. And now to our closing song, How Lovely on the Mountains. And so we close our service with a prayer and a blessing. Eternal God and Father, by whose power we are created, and by whose love we are redeemed. Guide and strengthen us by your Spirit, that we may give ourselves to your service and live this day in love to one another and to you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with us all, all those we love, all those we care for, and all those we pray for, now and evermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs>